fresh meat. Holiday horror really just hits the spot. Whether we're getting into the Christmas spirit with Black Christmas or psyching people out with some April Fool's Day, themed horror has really cemented its place in history. And our theme is downright romantic on today's Real Slashers. Look, I know this show is called Real Slashers, but we may as well have called it the Canadian Slasher Show with how many great ones we feature here. But I'm sorry, we just can't help it. The country up north really knows how to slice up ne'er-do-wells. And, I mean, we are a Canadian company after all. And nothing feels more Canadian than today's pick, My Bloody Valentine. This ain't no fairy tale, little girl. If you don't take it seriously, you're a fool. Originally titled The Secret, My Bloody Valentine was filmed in an actual mine in Nova Scotia, Canada. It has a pretty basic setup. The town of Valentine Bluffs has banned Valentine's Day celebrations after a tragic incident 20 years earlier. With the skeptical youth wanting to still properly celebrate, they take things into their own hands. But someone doesn't want the dance to happen, and they'll do whatever they can to stop it. You just know that means murder. The mayor's canceled the dance, and that's all there is to it. With their party now canceled, they think of the only logical thing to do. Throw a secret party at the old mine. There's just no way that can go wrong. Heh. <laughs> After a few absolutely brutal deaths, shit has officially hit the fan. And this is where the movie does what most slashers wouldn't. It gets most of the characters to safety. All these people are sensible enough to know that they need to get out of Dodge. It's this kind of character logic that makes the film feel very unique. I want to thank you guys for watching Real Slashers and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. One of the best aspects of the movie are the wonderful characters. I've never felt more connected to a group of slasher victims. And that's because they actually feel like real people. They're constantly having fun and joking around with each other. Even the love triangle between Axel, Sarah, and TJ feels pretty grounded. TJ left because he had big city dreams, only to fail and come crawling back. Sarah, having been left and feeling slighted, found comfort in the arms of Axel, all the while never really falling out of love with TJ. So you understand why there's so much hate between TJ and Axel while not overly making either of them a villain. I mean, at least not yet. Though with all my talk of great characters, there's one I have to talk about that I cannot stand. Patty. After the death of her boyfriend, she is an inconsolable mess. This wouldn't be a problem, except this causes her to go into single brain cell mode. She won't get up to get away from the killer. She won't move up the ladder to get away from the killer. She won't do anything. So it's pretty hard to feel bad for her when she eventually gets a pickaxe to the gut. Filming on the movie was anything but easy. Since the mine had only recently been shut down, there were still significant amounts of methane gas present. If you didn't know, methane is super flammable and is a big reason why mines are so dangerous to be in. So they had to evacuate no less than six different times. Not only that, but the lights they'd brought in were deemed too hot. Low wattage bulbs, different lenses, and faster film were used, and this significantly upped the budget. While there's not any specific killer theme that stands out like Jason's, John McDermott actually provides vocals for The Ballad of Harry Warden, which plays over the end credits. It's actually a beautiful song which further highlights the uniqueness of the film. I mean, how many slashers have a song like this? Or the legend they say on a Valentine's Day. Eventually, down in the mine, we discover that Axel is the one that's been killing everybody. He's gone absolutely nutso. The whole ending feels like it's setting up a sequel, but unfortunately, we just never saw that. It's Harry Warden! He's here! Everybody get the fuck out! Go! Chances are, if you were to just picture a killer miner, the one you'll conjure up is the killer here. 
I mean, unless you watched a lot of Scooby-Doo. His all-black ensemble, basic miner's mask, and signature pickaxe make for a terrifying image. The miner's real name is Harry Warden, a worker at the mine who went crazy and killed a bunch of people at the Valentine's Day dance. He was caught and spent his days in a mental asylum. But when the mayor and sheriff receive a bloody warning, Harry is thought to have escaped. We get to spend the rest of the time trying to figure out if Harry has returned or if someone else in the town is taking his place. And as it turns out, Axel had witnessed Harry Warden murder his father. So when he finds out that his friends are trying to hold another V-Day dance, despite Harry's warning, he decides to take matters into his own hands. The whodunit nature applied to not just the audience, but also the cast themselves, as they weren't informed of who the killer was during filming. The director did this so that none of the actors would give any tells and play their roles any different. So even though Axel is the murderer, the actor is completely unaware, so he's playing his heroic moments straight. Honestly, I think it just makes rewatches even more fun. And the miner is just absolutely brutal in this movie. I mean, this guy's reaction to finding his girlfriend's dead body gives me nightmares. And the uncut version gives us this wider shot of her body just hanging up there. Oh, it's brutal. And the nail gun to the head, pickaxe to the eye. The miner really gets around. Peter Cowper played both Harry Warden as well as the miner in most scenes. Neil Affleck's Axel just kind of plays Harry for the final reveal. So even though his character is to have done the killings, Cowper is the one that gets the performance credit. And he absolutely nails it. His body language is both intimidating and powerful. It's clear from the moment that he shows up that there's just something not quite right. And the fact that we don't see his face, that's all body language. So bravo to Peter Cowper. You know what we need? Yeah, I got one right here. <laughs> no, I meant a couple of beers. Most of the characters here are pretty horned up, but there's honestly something sweet about it. All of these couples genuinely feel like they're in love and would do anything for each other. It's much better than the one-sided relationships that are often on display in slashers. And it usually means more small, loving moments versus just gratuitous nudity. Not that we have a problem with the latter. First, we've got the main love triangle between Axel, TJ, and Sarah. Despite it being the most prominent story, it actually has some of the least chemistry between actors. But this also seems to be on purpose, as it causes the audience to distrust both of these men, which obviously lends to the whodunit nature of the story. And it doesn't make you want to see Sarah with either of them. You know why, TJ. And I really want to know what was going on between Mabel and Chief Newbie. This look in his eyes when Mabel posthumously leaves him a valentine? Ouch. John and Sylvia try and hook up in the showers, but Sylvia's alcoholism gets the best of them, and she pays the price for it. While these two hardly get any screen time, we're able to surmise so much of their characters because of the little details. Look at how Sylvia can hardly contain herself here. She's just so in love. Then the terror that John has on his face as he finds her body says it all. Everyone's getting in on the action. The killer even fills up a boob here. I mean, our miner is getting more action than any other killer featured on the show. And it's consensual, which is oddly enough even more surprising. The entire scene is overtly sexual, with the woman even stroking his helmet hose like it's a, well, you know. And in typical killer fashion, he gets distracted by murder. Forget about having a party at all on Saturday night. You may not live to see daylight. Beware of what you make fun of, you little asshole. The bartender Happy has been warning everyone the entire time that if they don't watch out, Harry Warden will come and get them. He plays a really similar role as the Hitchhiker from Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Crazy Ralph from Friday the 13th, where he's mostly serving as exposition for the audience. It could be you! He keeps saying bad things are coming, and yet no one listens. To be fair though, even Happy doesn't take his own advice. 
Wanting to play a prank on the kids, Happy decides to set up this little contraption. When they open the door, bam, there's the miner. I think what I enjoy the most out of this is that he just can't get enough of his little joke. He just keeps cackling to himself over just how much this is going to get the partiers. He keeps repeating it over and over. I mean, look at the pure glee on his face. I don't get that happy about anything. Unfortunately, this love for the mundane is his undoing as he opens the door and the real miner is there. He gets pickaxed in the jaw and it's one of the more brutal kills with just how good it looks. This kill would later be repeated for My Bloody Valentine 3D with the Tom Atkins character. It's deliciously ironic that the guy who keeps warning everyone is one of the first to succumb. And the image of the miner dragging Happy's body will stick with you long after the film ends. From the heart comes a warning filled with bloody good cheer. Remember what happened as the 14th draws near. My Bloody Valentine released to theaters on February 11th, 1981. Unfortunately, it did anything but light the box office on fire. Grossing only $5.7 million, the film was considered a failure by Paramount. It's really no surprise that the film had no legs when you look at the controversy around the release. See, the MPAA absolutely butchered the film, forcing the filmmakers to cut several minutes of footage. This was a direct response to Paramount's Friday the 13th, which released the year prior. So while the wonderful characters are still there, some of the payoff of their brutal demises are chopped down to almost nothing. For nearly 30 years, Paramount claimed that the footage was lost. Thankfully, the cut gore effects were eventually restored for a special edition DVD put out by Lionsgate. Still, the footage was grainy and somewhat took you out of the film. But leave it to Scream Factory to release it on Blu-ray where they cleaned it up almost entirely, deaths included. It's a stunning disc and one that all fans should seek out. And no, we may not have gotten the sequel that was seemingly set up at the end of the film, but after years of trying, a remake finally released in 2009. It's an absolute blast from start to finish. And if you want to find out more about this movie, check back later this week for a deconstructing My Bloody Valentine 3D. It's a doozy. What's all the more impressive with the film is that director George Mahalka completed it from start to finish in just six months. They say pressure creates diamonds, and this certainly appears to be the case as My Bloody Valentine has persevered through the years. Amongst the many different slashers, there are few better. And when February rolls around, just remember. Sarah, be my bloody valentine.